and welcome to Bethany Church. I'm Carly Sacali, here to spend the next couple of minutes with you before service. We're so glad you're here this morning, whether you're right here in the sanctuary or joining us online. So let's take this time to settle in, find a good seat, and get ourselves prepared for a great service. But before we go any further, let's take a second to welcome anyone joining us for the first time today. If that's you, we want you to feel welcome and able to worship however you're most comfortable because we're a church that loves to worship God. We also love to expand our community and make new friends. And that means we wanna to get to know you. A great way to do this is to check out our Bethany app and find our digital connection card. Just tell us your name, how you heard about us and who you brought with you today. All of this is how we can start to know you and your family and get you all connected here at Bethany. The app and website are also a great way for you to learn a little bit about us and see what ministries and groups might be a good fit for you. And on your way out today, don't forget to say hello in person to our greeters at the information desk. They'd love to say hello and give you a small welcome gift. Well, this week we're still in our Breakthrough Faith series and we have already covered a lot of ground. We've talked about Noah, Abraham, Sarah, all of these people who have been foretold or promised something by God that took incredible faith to believe. They had to believe what God said to find protection like Noah and the flood. Abraham had to believe God if he ever wanted to find blessing and prosperity. And Sarah had to believe God could do what logic said shouldn't be able to happen and give them a child. This week, we will continue to be encouraged by Pastor Dave in this chapter of Hebrews and get more insight into what breakthrough faith looked like in the past and how it is still the same in the present because our God's unchanging, and that's pretty exciting. We'll be looking at some announcements a little later on in the service, but you can always check out the app or the website for more details on small groups meeting during the week and upcoming events. Also, you can head over to Facebook and Instagram so you always have updates and reminders in your news feed. And we also have our YouTube channel where you can revisit the service anytime. Well, now we're gonna get ourselves ready for this time of worship and focus on God and nothing else. Let's all set aside our to-do lists and planning ahead, but I'm not gonna tell you to just set aside your concerns and cares. Actually, right now, think of what they are. And instead of pushing them aside for a moment, just to pick them back up on your way out, let's do exactly what God has told us we can do and cast our cares on Him. First Peter says to cast our cares because he cares for us. And Psalm 55 says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will not let the righteous be shaken. And you know, casting something off doesn't mean a weak toss to the side. It means a forceful and decisive repulsion in one direction. It's confidence that if we let things go, that God will pick it up for us, carry the weight of it, and free up our minds and hearts to hear from him clearly so we can walk into a victory. That is what breakthrough faith is all about. It's knowing. It's the substance of things you can't see yet, that God is more than able and willing to heal, to revive, to solve every problem. And more than that, it's having the confidence that he wants to do all that for us. He has purposes and plans for each of us that he wants us to thrive in. And he doesn't want us broken down, depressed, burdened, or held back, but we're to be more than conquerors through Christ. So cast your cares this morning, look them straight in the eye and fling them far, far away. Let's have an awesome service, Bethany. Amen. Good morning, church. How is everybody today? We're going to take attendance. If you're here, raise your hand. <laughs> Some of you are here. All right. I want to, I want to give you a little bit of a, a, an image here this morning to grab hold of. Uh, Michelle shared this with me yesterday from another pastor who was preaching this message, and I thought it was really good to talk about how we get into our, our talking about faith and breakthrough faith especially and, and he was holding up this mirror and looking at it. And while looking at this mirror, he's walking all over the stage. I can't do this right this second. I need the microphone. But he's looking at this mirror, and he's about ready to walk off the stage. And all he can see is himself, and all he can see is the people behind him. And the whole point here being that we need to keep our eyes fixed forward, not on ourselves and not on our past. And I'm going to talk about this a whole lot when we get to the message this morning. Yeah, amen. 
Keep our eyes fixed forward on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. And so I want us to do that this morning. And I want to share a passage of scripture from Psalm 137, particularly verse 2. It says, lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Can I ask you all to stand? And can we do that here this morning just for now? Just lift your hands and begin to thank God for who you are. Begin to thank God for who he is. Begin to thank God for what he's doing in and through you and through your church and through your neighbors, your family, your friends. Just thank God. God, we bless you today. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. Our eyes are fixed on you. Our eyes are forward, not on ourselves, not on our past, but fixed on you. You're the reason we're here to worship. You have us all here for a reason today, God. And would you reveal that to us through this time together? We pray it in Jesus' name as all of God's children said. Amen. Amen. Amen.
so worthy of all our praise and we stand in his love here today let's continue worshiping
are stretched out to you our hearts are turned to you our eyes our lives our beings are turned to you God for you are great you are worthy of our praise you are worthy of our blessings you are worthy of it all God and we cry out to you today thank you Jesus would you do something in and through us today would you bring about the transformation our lives need would you remove all the distractions around us that we might fix our eyes on you and hear and see nothing but you and your truth today? And all of God's children said, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Can all those kiddos come up? All right, I have a Bible verse to read to you this morning. It's John 1, 14, and it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I have some pictures here to show you of the different kinds of housing that people have lived in over the years. This one's a log cabin. lots of you here today to show everybody the picture okay who knows what this one is what is it an igloo, an igloo. do you know that Eskimos didn't actually live in igloos igloos were temporary housing that they used when they were hunting they would build them they would stay in them while they were hunting and then they would leave them this next one is, what's that one? Wait. It's not a tent. It does look like a tent. What is that called? A teepee. Good job. Who lived in teepees? Go ahead. Yeah, Native Americans lived in teepees. They don't live in teepees anymore, though. We, there's still Native Americans here in our country, but they live in regular houses like we do. And this one, this is a house from the Bible times. So the Bible tells us that Jesus came to live among us. He had to leave his perfect home in heaven. And he didn't come down and live in a mansion and have all the coolest toys that babies back then could have. He came down and he lived in one of these dirt houses and lived just like we did. And do you know why he did that? He did that so that he could live the same way as us and so that we could have our faith in him because we know that he faced the same struggles as we did and he lived just like we did 
and he set an example for us for how we should live. He faced all the same things that some of us face. Maybe our houses aren't the coolest or our toys aren't the coolest. We all have problems in our lives that we face, family drama, anything. But Jesus had a lot of that too, and he lived just like we did, but he was still perfect, and he grew up, and he set that example, and then he died on the cross to save us from our sins, because we're not perfect through all those hard times, right? So he did it so that we could have good, strong faith in him and, and rely on him in those hard times and remember that he did all that for us. Let's pray about that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for coming down from your perfect home in heaven into the discomfort that you had to live in here on earth. Thank you that you carry us through all of our hard times and that someday we get to go live in a perfect heaven with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. We want to take this time in our service to make sure that you know what's happening around here at Bethany and keep you updated on new things coming up. From group life offerings to events, you can always check out the Bethany app or the website for more details and even more info that we can't get into right now. But here's a couple of things we wanted to highlight this morning. Let's start by looking at group life. We know there's a benefit in coming together in community to study and explore scripture and have the support of other believers. Coming this March are three new opportunities to study different biblical topics. The first is the daytime's men's group studying the Psalms. This study meets on Thursday mornings at West Coastville starting on March 14th. Two other groups will dive deeper into what we've been studying on Sunday mornings, Hebrews 11 and Breakthrough Faith. The first group, the Kingdom Heroes, will look specifically on the heroes of the faith described in that chapter. The second group will use a video series from Chip Ingram entitled Breakthrough and explore what breakthrough can mean in our individual lives, in our church, and out in our community. Sign up on the app to get your spot if you're interested in any of these upcoming offerings. Next, this announcement is a very important announcement if you're a kid here at Bethany because Easter is on the way and that means Easter egg hunts and candy. Now adults, if you can take the time to buy and donate candy for this Easter fund, we would really appreciate it and the kids would too. You can take your donations to the children's ministry desk or drop it off in the church office. Finally, we are looking for a coordinator for our emergency food bank. Now, having a food bank is such an important ministry that meets a critical and time-sensitive need in our community. We need someone to lead and coordinate the details of making sure that we're prepared to meet the needs whenever they arise, someone to shop for the food, handle food donations, and keep everything organized. Now, if you are someone you know is this type of organized person who has the desire to serve in this way, please contact the church office to see if you're the right fit. Well, that's all we have time for right now. Let's head back into the service and into a time of offering and giving back to God out of all the good He's given to us. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you who are worshiping here today. And if you're worshiping with us for the first time, we invite you to stop at the information desk following worship. There'll be somebody there to greet you. Uh, we'd like to learn your name and just a little bit about you, uh, as well as give you a small gift for being with us this morning. So we are in the season of Lent, which is the time between Ash Wednesday and Easter. And this is the time when we can look deeply into ourselves and try to identify with the sacrifice that Christ made for us on Good Friday. And many of us will do things like let go of candy, let go of caffeine. No, I have not let go of my Diet Coke. Okay, just for those of you who are encouraging me in that direction, that hasn't quite happened. Um, maybe you let go of technology. Some of you are off of Facebook or Instagram for the season of Lent. So I've been asking myself, what is it that God, what earthly treasures am I hanging on to that God wants me to let go of so that I can better understand the sacrifice of Jesus. And in Matthew 6, which you can read before your nap time, sorry, Pastor Dave, I already gave him a, an assignment for today. But Matthew 6, it tells us that where our treasures are, that's where our heart will be also. That's where we will find it in ourselves to let go of things. So if we're hanging on to earthly treasures, 
We need to let go of those so that we can hang on to eternal treasures, things that are going to matter for an eternity. So as you give this morning, I invite you to consider that question of what earthly treasures are you hanging on to that if you let go, you could more fully understand the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. For every one of us, that's going to be different. For some of it, it's going to be time. For some of us, it's going to be money. That's an earthly treasure. And I heard Pastor Dave speak this morning a little bit about eternity and um, things that we hold on to here on this earth. So you're going to hear more about that in his sermon this morning. What is it for you that you're holding on so tightly to and you need to let go of in order to fully understand the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it's with grateful hearts that we recognize the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. He let go of it all for each one of us. Father, I pray that you would speak into each of our hearts now that we might know what it is that we're holding on to so tightly and we need to let go of. What earthly things we need to let go of so that we can experience eternal treasure. As we give our tithes and offerings this morning, Father, as we bring that to your altar, pray that you would speak into our hearts and that we would have ears to listen and a heart to hear what you're saying to us. Let us let go of the things that hold us here on earth and keep us from an eternity. I pray this in Jesus' name. You can bring your offerings forward during the next song. So we pull- 
God's children said. Amen. You may be seated. Faith. What is it? Being sure of our hope. Convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain. And for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run. Run with endurance the race set before us. Your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. I think all of us could agree that faith is this concept or this concept of faith is central to our life as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Can we all agree with that this morning? We need to have this faith. And I want to use this old illustration. We're getting feedback, guys. I want to use this old illustration going way back. I've used this several times throughout my career preaching. But I want you to picture yourself at the Niagara Falls. I don't care if you're New York side or Canadian side. I want you to picture a tightrope strewn all the way across from one side of the falls to the other. And I want you to picture this tightrope walker walking over the Niagara Falls. And he's pushing a wheelbarrow. I want you to picture that in your mind for a moment. And after watching this guy go back and forth several times, he gets to the end and he says, I want to volunteer to get in the wheelbarrow. (laughs) Now, I think at an intellectual level, we're all thinking, all right, we just watched him do this several times. The guy can do it. He's done it. He's famous for it, whatever else. But would you get in? (laughs) How many of us could say, oh, I'm, I'm up for an adventure. I'll get in. Not too many hands going up here today. The 8 o'clock crowd, a bunch of it. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Even less one up there. You see, here's the thing about this. You're not exercising biblical faith until you get into that wheelbarrow and can trust the tightrope walker. Genuine biblical faith expresses itself in this way in everyday life. Genuine biblical faith walks the talk that we like to proclaim day in and day out. In fact, you know what? The Apostle James picked up on this, and we're going to cover James once we get done here with Hebrews. So in a couple of weeks, he says in James 2.17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith works through love to produce this tangible evidence of its existence in our lives. And to put it another way, 
the obedience that pleases God comes from faith. And this is what we read in Hebrews eleven six 6 and, and in other places throughout the Bible. It talks about how it is impossible to please God without faith. In fact, it doesn't come from a mere sense of duty or obligation. Maybe you can think of it this way, especially you husbands out there. My wife, Jennifer, would love if I surprised her with flowers more often than I do. And, and I do surprise her with flowers, but it's more out of a, a sense of duty. I feel the peer pressure from all the other guys who are out on Valentine's Day and Mother's Day. And, and when they have to say, I'm sorry, they're out there shopping. And I feel the peer pressure from that. So I give in and I do the same thing at those times. But there's a difference, what I'm getting at here, between a husband who buys his wife flowers out of pure delight than one who does it out of a sense of duty or a sense of obligation. And, and here's the thing about this type of faith that we're referring to here today. Faith is so important because it's the means by which we have a relationship with God in the first place. In fact, Ephesians, Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Very familiar verse to most people. It says, for by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. This is not on your own doing. It is a gift of God. Faith, in my opinion, is how we receive the benefits of what Jesus has done for us. Amen. He lived a perfect life in obedience to God. He died the penalty to pay for our sinful rebellion against God. He rose from the dead to defeat sin. He rose from the dead to defeat death and the devil once and for all. And by putting our faith in Jesus, not only do we receive forgiveness of our sins, but we also receive this gift of eternal life. And so let's break down what this faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, actually says today. Because simply put, Faith means relying completely on who Jesus is and on what he has done to make us right with God. Faith means that we get into the wheelbarrow because we know Jesus is the one controlling that. He is the one pushing that wheelbarrow wherever it might be. And we can see this played out in Ephesians chapter 11, or Hebrews chapter 11, excuse me, verses 13 through 16. In fact, let's go there and read this for today. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. Highlight, underline, circle that. That's the key part there. Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of what land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Would you bow and pray for me as I pray for all of us? God, we are honored once again to be in your presence. We are honored once again to get to open up your word, to read from it, to learn from it, to grow from it. And so, God, would you help us with it today? Inscribe it on our hearts. We want to live it for your glory. Do something in and through all of us as you make our hearts pliable to receive what you have for us here today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, How many of you know that when you go on a vacation or a journey, what you have in mind is the destination, right? How many of you know you have a vacation coming up or you're going somewhere that you're already thinking about it? I'm already thinking about we're already planning a trip in September. My mind is in September already, and that's a couple months away. We have the destination in mind. And however comfortable the plane ride might be, or however nice the hotel rooms, or the beautiful view, however delicious the meals are along the way, you enjoy them for a moment, because it's just in that moment, because you have somewhere else to get to, or you have home to return to. You see, the traveler doesn't stay long along the route because it's the, the end of the journey that is in mind. 
And again, use this analogy of this mirror here, and I love this for today because it's so important. If we keep our eyes fixed on us, if we keep our eyes fixed on what's behind us, there's a good chance that we could, I knew that was coming, we could fall and hurt ourselves, right? It's so important to know and keep our eyes on the destination, the prize, if you will. And I think about that as we look at these patriarchs of faith here in Hebrews chapter 11. They knew that this earthly place, this earthly scene is transitory. It's not permanent. They knew that they were headed for a heavenly destination, a heavenly home. And here's my first point for today. Our true destination is heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, when we die, we die in faith. And that's what we see here in the first part of verse 13. All these, the patriarchs specifically, says all these died in faith. Now, where the author of the Hebrews letter here was writing all about life and faith, and we were learning all about that, here he transitions to begin to focus on this concept of death. And, and it's not something that they were worried about back then, because when it came to their death, they were still trusting in God. They were still trusting in who God is. And, and, and it says, all these died in faith, again, particularly Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob in, in this particular sense here. They were the ones who never received them, or they received the mighty promises of God, but they were never fulfilled. They were the ones who left the land and could have returned. They were the ones who died, unlike Enoch, when we studied Enoch, you remember Enoch from a couple of weeks ago, Enoch was walking with God and then was no more, right? He was just taken. And, and so they all died in faith. They died believing in the promises of God, even though they never received the promises of God. And that's the main point of verse 13. Look there again. All these died in faith without not receiving the promises. Now, this text is filled with so much application for us today. Can we today be like this, be like these guys and gals from so long ago? Because the premise of Hebrews chapter 11 is that we are called to live like those who lived before us. Not only in the way they lived, but also in the way they died. And Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, all of these guys and gals died in faith, believing in God, even though... They never received fully what was promised to them. I mean, you're going to hear me say that quite a bit because it's so important to know. And when it comes to the day of your death, you can begin to ask yourself, will I die in faith? Will I die like these folks did way back then? Even though I didn't receive everything I feel like I should have received from God, even though I didn't feel like I, I, I didn't receive all of the promises of God, can you say, like Job said in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Amen. Can we say with Jesus, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will, Father God. Right. Can we say with Paul, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Because when standing up for what is right, we want to be able to say, just like Esther said so long ago, if I perish, I perish, right? In other words, are you following the Lord only because of the blessings that he gives you in this life? Or are you following, following the Lord regardless of what you receive in this life? Because I think we all know difficulties will come. How many of you have difficulties on a daily basis, right? Maybe not daily, but you have them. And it's during those times that you can let those difficulties be the means by which you show your faith in God. No matter what is happening to you, you can still trust in God through it all. Because anyone can praise the Lord when things are going well. We do that often, right? But will you praise even when life isn't going in your favor? Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, Jacob, 
They lived difficult lives. They were foreigners in a strange land. They were surrounded by strange people. Just as some of you think you are sitting here today. (laughs) That can be truth, right? All they had was this hope that God would bless the world through them. They had very little. They had faith, even in the midst of it all, and they trusted in God. And in many ways, this is the great reality of Hebrews chapter 11. Now, we're going to get to Moses in a couple of weeks, but I want you to think about his story for a minute. Think about this. He's leading the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. They're wandering in the desert for some 40 years, and he never got to see the promised land, right? He ended up dying before that. And and this is the point of the end of the chapter when we start to read more about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and, and David and Samuel and the prophets. None of them ever received their promises either. And look with me to the very end of chapter 11. We're going to get there in a couple of weeks. But in in chapter 11, verse 39, it says, And all these, again, all of these saints, if you will, though commended through their faith, read the last part with me, did not receive what was promised. All of the Old Testament saints stood like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. None of them ultimately received the fulfillment of the promises. Jesus is the one who brought in the new covenant and all of the abundant blessings that have come to us with that, right? And the Old Testament or the Old Covenant saints could only look forward to what Jesus brought us, right? In fact, those are the very words the writer used to describe this perspective on the fulfillment of the promises. Look at Hebrews 11, 13 again. We're going to have this one memorized by the time we're done here today. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. This is all that they could do. All they could do is just see them, just as someone had this distant view of this distant country from maybe a high vantage point. And I say that because I think of uh, uh, Moses again. I go back to Moses over and over and over again. Here's a patriarch like Moses, able to get up on Mount Nebo, right? So he's at a higher vantage point, able to see the promised land. Able to see all that was there and yet never enter it, never have that promise fulfilled. And we fast forward to today and oh, how much different we stand today We live in the day of the new covenant. We have seen the fulfillment of what they could only hope for, what they were longing for, what they were looking for. We have seen it in Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. We have seen Jesus come in all of his fullness. And and this was a, a a thing that Brittany brought up earlier from John chapter one, verse 14. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Rejoice in these things today, church. Amen. Rejoice and receive what the prophets were longing for because we have that opportunity today. Realize the position that you're in. Think about that. Think about the position that you're in. Think of an orphan in a third world country. They would give anything to live the sort of life that we live here today. The opportunities that we have with education and wealth and success and all of these different things. And we are blessed by it. And I think back to the patriots, patriarchs again. They died only looking for longing for what we have today. Will you die in faith like Abraham? Will you die in faith like all the patriarchs did? Will you die looking for and longing for that day, this this day heavenward in Christ Jesus? Will you die seeing and welcoming that day from a distance? Because a life of faith will do that, right? And that's one of the biggest lessons we learn from this text today. But there's a second point. Not only were the patriarchs dying in faith, 
They were also living in hope. That's the second point here. They had a living hope about them. And I want to show you this by walking through the Hebrew writer's logic in these next couple of verses. Again, let's start in verse 13. So important. We'll do the whole thing this time. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. The main thing we need to see here, that part of the the verse where there are strangers and exiles on the earth. Go back to Abraham's time. Abraham was 75 years old when he left the land of Ur. He said he was a stranger and sojourner when Sarah died at the age of 127. That puts him at the age of 137. He was 10 years older than her. And if you do the math, which I don't typically like to do, but I did it all for you today, you're going to see that this puts Abraham in the land for more than 60 years. Right? He still considered himself 60 years living in this land. He still considered himself a stranger and an exile. Why? Because he and the other patriarchs knew that their time on earth was limited. I want to borrow one more illustration today. Something I've done before. You all are pretty familiar with this, I think, for the most part. I'm going to bring out the trusty old rope again. And if you remember, the rope represents life and eternity. This part, this little piece, represents life. Whether it's zero years or, like Abraham, 137 years, right? All of this then represents what? Eternity, right? And so we have to keep this into perspective while we're thinking about this. This little blip on earth right here, right now, and then all of this. And the writer makes all of these implications then in these next couple of verses, beginning in verse 14, where he says, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Now, even though God promised to Abraham this land of Canaan, where where he was when he said all of these things, right? Abraham never settled down in that land. Nor did he ever lay claim to that land. He didn't say, well, I am Father Abraham, and therefore I get this land, nobody else gets it. No, there was none of that. Instead, he considered himself a foreigner. He considered himself an exile. He considered himself a stranger, right? Uh, This alien, if you will, in this promised land itself. And, And this means that he thought that he was traveling someplace. Right? It means that, He has a destination in mind. But where might that destination be? Verse 15 eliminates one possibility, but then shows us another. The writer continues in verse 15. If they, the patriarchs, had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to turn back. But again, they weren't looking at themselves. They weren't looking behind. They were looking ahead, and none of them ever return to their home country. Why? Because they were looking forward to what was what lied ahead. Because God had promised them the land of Canaan. And it was a demonstration of their faith to, to stay momentarily right where they were at. And yet while they stayed where they were at, they still considered themselves to be aliens and strangers, exiles. They were looking forward Even while there, they weren't looking back. And so what do we make of all of this today? The very first part of verse 16 tells us, but as it is, they desire a better country. That is what? A heavenly one. And this is my point. The patriarchs were living in hope. They were living in hope for a better country. They were living in hope, not with their eyes set on themselves or, or in their past. They were living in hope for something better. And, and where is this country that they're looking for? And it tells us in verse 16, it's a heavenly one. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, all of these patriarchs were living in hope for this 
distant country, this, they were looking for, they, they weren't looking for an earthly country. They were seeking this heavenly one. They were looking for, with this living hope for another world while living where they were at. And the application for all of this just begins to jump off the pages for us today, folks. This is how we are to imitate their faith. We also ought to hope for a heavenly country because, folks, it's all we got to make a difference here because this is what matters most, right? And this goes on and on and on and on. I might as well wrap it up while I'm here. (laughs) And it just keeps going. And it doesn't end. Peter picked up on this. Peter was right, and he's like, listen, we are aliens and strangers in this world. Jesus picked up on this, right? He says, seek first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Paul says, listen, folks, set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. John tells us, do not love the world nor the things of this world. So as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, can we ask the question today, where is your hope? Ask that of yourself. Where is my hope? What are you seeking? What are you looking for? What are you longing for? Because if your hope is on this earth, you will make decisions that are consistent with your hope. But if your hope is in heaven, you will make decisions decisions consistent with your hope right when your heart is in another place it will change the way you live in other words our hope ought not be here in america folks great as it is right our hope ought to be elsewhere our hope ought to be in heaven and we ought to be willing to leave all of this behind and pursue that You see, the promises of eternity are far greater than what we have here on this earth. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. He's like, listen, man, in everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Look at those points again. Point number one, they were dying in faith. Point number two, they were living in hope. And the third and final point is that the patriarchs were secure in God. Think about that. They were secure in God. Look at the second part of verse 16. Yeah, the band can make their way back up here a while. Um, Second part of verse 16. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city. I think we all know and understand that there are things in this life that are not secure. Investments, houses, they can burn down. Cars break down, right? Things get stolen from us. Friends and relatives die. Relationships are broken. But in verse 16 here, we see security. It's God's affirmation that God is not ashamed to be called their God. And I believe this is primarily a reference to the patriarchs, of course, because we have to keep things in context. This is the writing. God is not ashamed to be identified with Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, all of those folks. But the great reality of this for us today is this. Not only has God delighted to take on the names of the patriarchs, but he has also delighted to take on the names of all who believe. And this applies to all of us here today, church. Amen. We are called sons and daughters of God. We are adopted. We are heirs according to the promise. And that's the reality of the New Testament, right? The new covenant. Look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. God says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And if God is not ashamed to take on our name, what does that mean for our hope in eternity, for eternity? It means that our eternity is secure. Yes, you can say that, folks. Your eternity is secure. 
And, and if God is not ashamed to take that on, why should we be ashamed to take on God, right? If God is not ashamed of you, what do you have to fear? Because there is absolutely nothing to fear. There is nothing that people can do that will affect your eternity. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 10, 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before man, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And I'll picture, picture this one final scene. You're standing before the throne of God on judgment day. You're guilty. <laughs> You're guilty of all your sins, right? But while on earth, at some point along your journey, you said, Jesus, I believe in you. And you begin to profess Jesus to other people. And your faith in Jesus Christ wipes away all of those sins and you're made righteous to stand before God. And Jesus says, I know Dave. He wasn't ashamed of me. I'm not ashamed of him. Father, forgive him. Let him come into the city which we have prepared for him. Amen. And this is the thought of the second part of verse 16. Again, let's go there. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And where does that leave you today, church? Where does that leave all of us? Where is your faith in all of this? Is it in the one who's looking back at you in the mirror? Is it in what's behind you? Is it in your spouse, your career, your significant other, your children, grandchildren? Or is it where it belongs in Jesus? I'm going to let you answer that question as we go to God in prayer. God, we thank you. Thank you for this message of hope. Thank you for this message that gives us something to long for, something to look forward to. God, we don't want it just for ourselves, though. There are a lot of people in this world, a lot of people that are suffering and dying without this hope. And so, God, would you envelop your people here today with this hope? Would you saturate our lives with this hope that we have to look forward to? That we get to carry around with us everywhere we go. But not to keep for ourselves, it's to share. God, would you give us these opportunities every single day as we continue to look to you for hope. Bless, inspire, and encourage your people each and every day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. I'm going to transition into this closing song. I'm going to ask if the prayer ministers wouldn't mind coming up. If you want prayer, come to them. If you want to just come to the altar rail by yourself, just say, listen guys, I'm not going to offend anybody here. <laughs> I just want to pray by myself. That's okay. But let's just spend some time here today doing exactly what God wants from us, putting our faith in him as our living hope. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus, for setting us free. Thank you, for Jesus, for giving us that living hope in you and you alone. As we leave this place today, may we keep our eyes fixed on you. May we keep our eyes looking forward, not on ourselves, not in our past, but heavenward in Christ Jesus. Go now in peace as children of God, as all of God's children said. Amen. Amen.